Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this yet another edition in our weekly Humanist Speaker Series. Today, we are talking about fairness and fighting historical revisionism. Today is about keeping religion and government separate. Additionally, there's a couple other commemorations to mention. Today also marks the 32nd commemoration of National Coming Out Day, a day that represents visibility for LGBTQIA people. There are a lot of parallels between humanists and atheists and LGBT folks, including a significant overlap, including myself. We have a lot of LGBT people in our organization, in our community. And one thing that, that helps us all is visibility. So happy coming out day. Tomorrow also marks the 28th commemoration of Indigenous Peoples Day. In 1992, on the 500th anniversary of the voyage of discovery to the New World, the city of Berkeley rec rec recognized and commemorated Columbus Day as Indigenous Peoples Day. Since then, a number of states have included Indigenous Peoples Day on the calendar, replacing Columbus Day as a state holiday. It's a day to remember and recognize those who were the brutalized victims of the Columbian exchange and thenceforward. So happy coming out day and a solemn Indigenous Peoples Day. So we come together to talk about humanism and one of the core tenets of humanism is fairness. Building upon that element of fairness, we demand a separation of religion and government. We demand a separation of religion and government because one of the other tenets of, of our philosophy is democracy. Democracy is about fairness. It's about one person, one vote in this procedural side, in its substantive side, its valuative side. It's also about certain norms that protect vulnerable people to keep people in the system as participants. So no matter how disadvantaged you are, you have ideally the same say as someone who's doing particularly well and who is particularly privileged. And in the past, when we combined religion and government, we see that kings and those appointed by the church, these higher authority, authority figures with their arbitrary whims, they're appointed by God, they're in communication with God, and they're protected through this arrangement. They're rarely removed. And it's an imposed hierarchy between people based upon this context. The United States set up a constitution with the exception of saying in the year of our Lord, the concept of God is not mentioned once in the constitution. In fact, the separation of church and state is mentioned twice once in the First Amendment, additionally in Article 6, Section 3, where there's no religious test that can be offered to restrict someone from holding public office or trust in the United States. Popular sovereignty, which is what we've based our country upon, has no place for gods or the supernatural. When you're dealing with politics and the concerns of the world, we have far too many serious concerns to involve fantasy or supernatural in this process. Serious problems require serious people to offer and implement serious solutions. In our last couple of, 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 of talks, I did a, a short reading. I did a short reading from John Fitzgerald Kennedy when we had Daryl Ray come and speak, I, I did a, a short reading from John Fitzgerald Kennedy's 1960, September 12th speech in Houston, Texas. Last week, I did a short reading from a Seneca chief on, on the chauvinism and arrogance of the Christian missionaries imposing their religion and being ambivalent and condescending about those who worship the great spirit 
And today I'd like to do another short reading, quite a short reading, but a necessary reading. Sometimes there are people who say things in a much more elegant or eloquent way than, than we typically can. And this person was the most popular speaker at his time. He was seen by in person more people than anyone else during his day. He was the most popular orator. He was a great public intellectual and also a great agnostic. That was his nickname, Robert Greene Ingersoll. Robert Greene Ingersoll published a speech that he did in the arena, a publication in 1890. I would like to read a few words from Robert Greene Ingersoll from his, his speech, God and the Constitution. Suppose then that we amend the Constitution and acknowledge the existence and supremacy of God. What becomes of the supremacy of the people? And how is this amendment to be enforced? A Constitution does not enforce itself. It must be carried out by appropriate legislation. Will it be a crime to deny the existence of a constitutional God? Can the offender be proceeded against in, criminal, in the criminal acts? Can his lips be closed by the power of the state? Would not this be the inauguration of religious persecution? And if there is to be an acknowledgement of, the God, of that God in the Constitution, the question naturally arises as to which God is to have this honor. Shall we select the God of the Catholics, he who has established an infallible church presided over by an infallible Pope? And how is this, how, and who is delighted with certain ceremonies and placated by prayers uttered in exceedingly common Latin. Is it the God of the Presbyterian and the five points of Calvinism, who is ingenious enough to harmonize necessity and responsibility, and who in some way justifies himself for damning most of his own children? Is it the God of the Puritan, the enemy of joy, of the Baptist, who is great enough to govern the universe and small enough to allow the destiny of a soul to depend on whether the body it inhabited was immersed or sprinkled? What God is proposed to be put in the Constitution? Is it the God of the Old Testament, who was a believer in slavery and who justified polygamy? If slavery was right then, it's right now. What court, what tribunal of last resort is to define this God? And who is to make known his will? In his presence, laws passed by men will be of no value. The decision of courts will, be, will mean nothing. All kings of this earth acknowledge the existence of God and God is their ally. And this belief in God is used as a means to enslave and rob and govern and to degrade the people whom they call their subjects. Ingersoll summed up his essay and that we have tried to include God in government in the past and it always inevitably fails due to the fact that people deserve and demand their rights to be respected. As we've seen the country unfold through history, we've seen religion increasingly creep into politics. For example, we can look at the Republican Party. 1905, Teddy Roosevelt said that it would be greatly impious to include God on the currency. However, one of his Republican successors in 1954, Dwight Eisenhower, worked with Congress when there was a visiting Presbyterian minister from Scotland to not only include God in the Pledge of Allegiance, but also on our money. And then from the 1970s forward, we have seen a slow creep to an all out takeover of the Republican Party, where the Republican Party under George W. Bush, when we see David Kuo's book, Tempting Faith, David Kuo being the first deputy administrator of the Office of Faith-Based Community Initiatives, becoming quite disillusioned by going into the hollowed halls of the White House and seeing that Karl Rove and George W. Bush were handing out pens and ashtrays as trinkets to placate, to harvest votes from the evangelical values voters, to the fact that today what we have is we have an outright clearinghouse of pernicious evangelical aspirations in the legislature, in the executive. And now we're seeing a justice come before the Supreme Court where there are great questions over her fitness to serve due to her connection in what many would otherwise call a cult. And then money, money in politics. 
George W. Bush's first executive order was to give billions of dollars to religious organizations in the Office of Faith-Based community, community Initiatives. Barack Obama expanded the amount of money going to religious organizations and when it upgraded to the Office of Faith-Based Community Partnerships. And now under Donald Trump, with the Paycheck Protection Act, we've seen almost $8 billion going to fund religious organizations and paying the salary of clergy. We can go back to Madison with the Memorial and Remonstrance Against Religious Assessments, where our, our fourth president wrote this brilliant screed about paying the salaries of clergy with public money. It's about fairness. A few years ago, it was estimated that religious organizations that receive tax exemption failed to put in $70 billion worth of their fair share. They get a huge benefit of being tax exempt while they don't play politics, but they get the benefit of receiving political money, public money. And we see this in terms of ideology. Initially, we saw Christianity coming in with the wedge issue, putting intelligent design, rebranded creationism put into our schools. And now we see this with what's called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. The first wave of Religious Freedom Restoration Acts came as a matter of the federal government and individuals. And now there's been this big second wave that corresponds with something called Project Blitz that I'm sure our speaker later today will, will discuss in which Religious Freedom Acts and Religious Liberty legislation is being used to try to reframe this issue and reshape the legal architecture of this country to allow Christian supremacy. And I say Christian supremacy because that's the intent. intent. Several years ago, there was a state legislator in Louisiana that wanted to offer a voucher program. And that voucher program was to allow kids to attend religious schools. But when it was brought up that that money could go to Muslim schools, that legislator, she freaked out and became her own bill's primary opponent. So this is about, this is about fairness. And there was an op-ed in the New York Times, speaking of the judiciary, there's an op-ed in the New York Times from September 22nd from Lee Epstein and Eric Posner, a law professor and a political science professor that looked at all the, all the terms of the Supreme Court going back to the Warren Court of the 1950s and looked at how the justices ruled when religion was a party. And it was kind of a half-half issue for a while, but up into the Roberts Court, it just skyrocketed. And the, the three most recent appointees to the court, Alito, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch have sided with religion nearly 100% of the time. Kavanaugh and Gorsuch 100% of the time. The justice who sided with religion the least happened to be Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and now she's gone. And this is about fairness. We want to see church and state religion and government separate. Because like Inger Solid said, what happens when you include God in the law? What happens when you include God in the law? Whose version, which version of the law, and what happens to the people when they violate those individual particular parochial concerns? To, to close out my initial thoughts on our meeting, I wanna close off with a few words from that essay, from that speech from Robert Greene Ingersoll. If God is allowed in the constitution, man must abdicate. There is no room for both. If the people of the great republic are superstitious enough and ignorant enough to put God in the constitution of the United States, the experiment of self-government will have failed. And the great and splendid declarations that all governments derive their just powers from the consent of the governed will have been denied and in its place will be found this, all power comes from God, priests are his agents, and people are their slaves. To open, to open our, our meeting today, we have a guest who has returned, Coral Annika Thiel. She was a member of People of Praise, a charismatic Catholic sect that many are calling a cult, 
She was a member of that organization from the late 70s to the early 80s. She and many other mem former members of People of Praise are speaking out with, a, with an air of warning about a current member of that particular religious sect, Amy Coney Barrett, who is currently a, justice, a judge on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. And she is Donald Trump's current nominee to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg as an associate justice before the, the United States Supreme Court. So, Coral, welcome, welcome to our chat today. Thank you. So, I have, I have a few questions for you. And if we could talk for maybe six or seven, eight minutes on this. Sure. So you were involved with, with people of praise. And at, in your last visit, when we were talking about religious trauma syndrome and healing from, from, from scars that were inflicted by being members of controlling repressive and pernicious religious sects and institutions, now we're going to talk about politics and religion today. So while this was almost four decades ago, and things may have changed, in the early days of people of praise, was there any talk of politics or political aspirations that you saw? Yes, I was asked that yesterday um, when I was with Stephen Hassan, the cult expert at Harvard. I know that we were in formation, we were discipled how to think, and we were told that everyone on the outside was poisonous and they were only the fresh water. So we were not allowed much outside contact. And for me as a hand, handmaid in the group, I wasn't allowed to read newspapers or other books or see family or talk to friends. Um, I do know that they only believe that marriage um, is between a man and a woman. And I know there was a gay son within the community and a lot of the men were very, very um, abusive in their words about him. He left and became a doctor. Um, his sister married within the community. I know that, um, yes, that's, that's the one doctrine I know about man and woman. They only believe in that as marriage. I, I've also learned <laughs> that other groups like them have been investigated and even the Catholic Church have shut them down. But the people of praise claims to be uh, ecumenical, even though 99.9 .9 of them are Catholics and even the head founder, Kevin Ranahan is a deacon, I still, I believe still in South Bend. Many of the ones in my community were uh, leaders in the local St. Mary's Church. But if they were affiliated with the church, I believe they would have been more investigated and possibly shut down, um, I suffered crimes from a lot of members. So as far as politics, I'm not sure they, they teach us, brainwash us, indoctrinate us how to believe, and especially the young people, or even like Amy Coney Barrett, I believe grew up in the, in the cult. She lived with the head founder, Kevin Ranahan, as a college student. So a lot of critical thinking is not encouraged, and I believe you become emotionally stunted in groups like that. And you were talking about the gender discrepancies in terms of the gender hierarchy. And in your book, pl pl please pronounce the, the is it Bonshia or oh, Bonshia? Bonshia. Bonshia is a Yaqui Indian word. It means out of the darkness into the light. And in, in your book, Bonshia, you, you say that they base their gender hierarchy in, in several scriptural passages, um, one of which is Ephesians 5, 22 through 24 saying, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. He himself being savior of the body, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be subject to their husbands in all things. Also Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 3, 11, 3, sorry. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man and the man is the head of every woman. So there's something that I, I find particularly interesting about this, that if there is this 
and, and perhaps you could shed some light on this and maybe things have changed in the last few decades and people have praised. No, um, they haven't but changed. You, you, you were mentioning how you, you went to, to court reporter school and you had a job and your husband, your ex-husband, sorry, brought you into people of praise. And while in there, he, he demanded that you leave your job so the question is, if there is such a strict and strong gender hierarchy, do they were they were they frowning upon women working outside of the home? Additionally, if if there is such a, a strict and strong gender hierarchy, how does it fit that that Judge Barrett not only went on to become a law professor, but additionally went on to become a judge? Yes, I can explain that. It's, if anyone has watched the Handmaid's Tale series that's based off of Margaret Atwood's Handmaid's Tale book, um, there's a hierarchy. And I was a handmaid. I had no rights. I was completely under my husband, who was also had another head. His name was Ed Brown. Ed Brown had a head. And it went all the way up to Father Charles Harris, who was from South Bend. Uh, Father Charles Harris uh, created the community in Corvallis, Oregon. He was a chaplain at the college, Oregon State University, and he met many of the Catholic students there who are still members uh, to this day. Um, so we were all under a hierarchy, all single men, all single women also were under uh, their heads, and many of the single people would live with a married couple, like Judge Amy Coney Barrett lived with the Renahans. Um, so uh, when you read the it said, in all things. In all things meant in all things. I had no rights. I had no rights to my body, um, to my mind, to my thoughts, to my identity. And I was under also my ex -hus my husband's head at that time. So if he said something and told my husband um, something to correct me or change or a direction, my husband would tell me to do so. An example, I had surgery. I lost, I had two miscarriages. At the time I was in the community. Um, the second one, um, I had a women's meeting soon after to go to. There was no exceptions. We went to meetings all the time. It keeps you busy. It keeps you indoctrinated. But I went to the women's meeting. They all wanted to go on a shopping excursion that night. And I said I couldn't. I was weak. I was still bleeding. I needed to be in bed having bed rest. And they were going to go shopping anyway. I, I think the base of the community is cruelty. There, there's very little compassion. But I went home. I said, I just need to go home then. Um, my head, at that time, I had also a handmaiden head. This sounds complex, but <laughs> you're under a lot of direction. What I'm trying to describe is Judge Amy Barrett's married to a leader. She grew up in it. She has more authority than I did. It's like in the handmaid's tale, there were Lydia's and their Serena's. They were um, over a lot of the handmaids. So my handmaid called my husband immediately that I was in disobedience. I had left the meeting. So when I got home, there was a car running and already a man in our home to watch our three younger children, Bruce Burning, and I was forced into the car. I did not wanna go. And my husband told me he had to take me to his head, Ed Brown. And I was then forced to go until late hours, early hours in the morning and interrogated. And I was told I was poisonous. I was told I did not, not know how to cut the mustard and and walk with Christ and um, that I was mentally ill. That was always something they continued to tell me because I asked questions. Even the head people from South Bend that lived in Corvallis, Oregon, they, you know, I, I'd ask questions. I wasn't conforming, so I was mentally ill, but I took care of their five-year-old child. So they use you, but then they shame you and humiliate and interrogate you. After that night, um, I couldn't conform. I went home. And my husband was told by his head the next morning, the entire community was told to shun me. And uh, I was forced to go to meetings after that on Sundays for months on end. And I was forced to sit out in the hallway outside their meetings at St. Mary's Catholic Church. And there's Dr. Paul Hesburgh Sr. from Wenatchee, Washington has come forward. He's called um, sources that I've been talking to and he's writing a witness statement and he saw me. He saw me abused by the community leaders. He saw me abused by my husband. He was my husband's uh, best friend at that time. So I have witnesses, neighbors, other former members who saw all of this 
and abduction, kidnapping, forced interrogation. Uh, these were just natural ways they treated you. It was coercive control. Um, but a lot of the members, they're taught that I'm being punished and I'm used an example uh, to others to warn them what will happen. And they all take a vow. It's like a marriage vow. I was there, I have the vow in my book, but it's a loyalty vow. And many of them believe they'll go to hell if they leave. So there's many red flags about this group, but as far as Judge Amy Coney Barrett, there were a few women in our community that worked, um, but they were in a higher hierarchy. And most of us didn't, and, and all of us, um, we were basically having all the children God meant for us. A contraceptive, contraceptives was um, wrong for us. So I ended up having 11 pregnancies eventually and eight, eight children. But they would threaten um, to take away your children. They sided with the men in the community if women ever left. And that was always my threat. And it's a psychological threat that no mother, no mother can sustain. So you attempt to figure out how to submit to all these threats and abuse. But eventually my health collapsed years later and I, I had to leave. And a lot of our judges in America do take our children as an example for leaving abuse or reporting abuse. So that's a warning. Uh, our communities, our, these type of communities are very much like our patriarchal court system. Even the district attorney, John Haroldson and Corvallis, Oregon wrote a review for me and said that I had gone into uncharted waters and was showing in my book how the religious uh, churches are practiced in our patriarchal court system. And one last question. And this, this one is, is one that I've posed a couple times. And we have, we have lots of, of writings, both academic and now judicial from, from Amy Coney Barrett. Um, and perhaps our, our, our speaker later in this, this Zoom call um, event can, can, can speak on this as well. But my question comes to this, considering that we have a lot of a lot of writings from Amy Coney Barrett, also considering, as I mentioned previously, that there were two places in the US Constitution that, that mentioned the separation of church and state. One, of course, being the First Amendment, which is the first aspect of the First Amendment. The second being Article 6, Section 3, which says no religious test shall be given to hold public office or, or trust in the United States. Um, you recently put out a letter that you're trying to testify before the United States Senate for the confirmation hearings, which are coming up very soon. Tomorrow. How, how, would, how would this impact that aspect of, of our separation of, of church and state that we cherish so much? Would this not amount to a religious test in terms of she belongs to this particular religious group? Therefore, if you belong to that religious group, you're not fit to serve in public office. Well, my answer to that is I'm, I'm for justice. I'm not against people. I'm for fairness is the mm -hmm. word you use. So it's not against her, but I have followed former victims, former casualties of the people of praise. A lot of them are not doing well. And I believe Amy Coney Barrett is complicit with this group of even the crimes that happened to me, to others. I was just on the phone the other night with someone else. Um, there's many of them that were in this group for 20 years, so they have even longer history. Um, but I'm against injustice, I'm against crimes, I'm against the subjugation of women and the oppression of women and children. And that is what this sect, this group is about. It's about the absolute obedience of women. And she is in direct submission to her husband. That's the vow she takes. It's the same loyalty vow. It's the same ideology. And I do not know how she could separate that. I even wonder, I had to have men in presence with me. They couldn't talk directly. And I had men checking on me throughout the day. But it's this direct submission to her husband who's in direct submission to another man who's in direct submission to the leader of their group in South Bend. And I don't know how she divides that. It's very different than being a Catholic and it's very different than any other group. It's, it's very uh, severe. So that's thank my- you. Thank 
Thank you so much, Coral. Thank you so thank much. You and for having me. Thank you for your bravery and sharing your story. And your book has, has touched so many people. And you. and you have so much courage to be, to, to have escaped uh, uh, such a, a terrible repressive community. And there are undoubtedly so many more men and women who, who, who need to hear your story to provide them strength that they're trying to escape. So thank you so May much. May I just add, add one thing? There are people sure. that are putting up videos that saw me on Democracy Now thanking me, thanking me for speaking that left other cults. And they just I find it very healing to hear of someone, even if my voice shakes, it's very difficult to talk about these things, but I am receiving hate mail. And now there is a smear campaign from the far right and my ex-husband is working with the Trump's watchdog teams. And it's all lies, but um, it's just what you have to accept if you put out your truth. But even my Senate letter is all documented with affidavits and documentation. And I just believe we have to show up and we have to be a voice. All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you.